Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar titled 2020 Regal Product Announcements for Airborne Surveying. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of including during this webinar, Mr. Peter Rieger, who is the Airborne Laser Scanning Business Manager for Regal Austria, uh, Laser Measurement Systems. And of course, I'm Michael Sitar, uh, Executive Management Consultant at Regal USA. As you know, the fall is always a, a busy time, um, and it's particularly synonymous with uh, all the product announcements the various manufacturers and software developments uh, announced to the industry. And uh, as you know, the uh, InterGeo conference uh, is usually held in Germany. Um, it is one of the largest uh, geospatial survey shows um, that, that exist. Uh, and for those that have been there, of course, it's a, it's a fabulous opportunity to see uh, so many of the product offerings that are made at this conference. Uh, this year, in particular, of course, it was a digital event. Um, and our objective today is actually to summarize the product announcements within the Airborne Laser Survey uh, business segment for Regal. Um, as a function of the announcements that occurred during the, the InterGeo show. So what we're going to do is, is cover the, the primary product announcements. Um, the first is our VQ1560 Mark IIs. It's a wide area mapping solution. And we'll go over into the details associated with the new improvements that we've made in range performance and other areas. Um, we also have a brand new VUX 120 compact LIDAR sensor, which can be deployed on either UAVs or low flying aircraft. We have a brand new VPX1 corridor mapping solution, and I'll discuss the, the sensor configuration options that are available with that new, new solution. And finally, we've also have introduced a meteorological probe, which allows us to capture uh, temperature, pressure, uh, humidity information during collection to provide a, a better accuracy associated with the um, with the range measurement corrections um, and the refraction associated with going through the atmosphere. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with um, uh, an installation example of our popular VQ1580 or 580 Mark II sensor. What you see here is the product portfolio within the ALS uh, business segment. Um, as I mentioned, the VQ1560 Mark IIs is the brand new product. Uh, it has an extended range performance capability, and it's really our total solution when it comes to wide area mapping. Um, it has all the necessary elements to be able to um, flight plan, uh, operate, control the sensor. Uh, it has the built-in uh, Planix high accuracy INS solution, and of course, some optional cameras. As we go down in altitude performance, we have a number of other products. Uh, finally, to our lowest uh, or newest sensor, the VUX120. And so, as you can see from this product portfolio, uh, we really have a sensor uh, that fits virtually every application and platform requirement. Now, specifically when it comes to the, the VQ1560 Mark IIs, its primary focus is on uh, wide area and 3D topo mapping applications. It's adept at urban mapping with its occlusion-free scan geometry and the crossfire scanner pattern. We'll cover that in a bit more detail. It's also used extensively for power line mapping. We're starting to see a repurpose of these high performance sensors for low um, altitude applications, particularly on corridor programs where an aircraft provides uh, increased productivity at speed and still able to deliver on the density requirements. And also, of course, in forestry and agriculture. Um, and th all these applications are really possible with the with the 1560 Mark II because it is a hybrid LiDAR and imaging solution that incorporates a, a dual laser. It's the only sensor on the market that has two independent ch IR channels um, in a single sensor configuration. It has integral camera ports to support optionally available 150 megapixel RGB and uh, NIR cameras so that uh, we can collect, co-collect four-band multispectral imagery if desired. Or similarly, if you're only interested in the RGB camera, the second camera port could be used for a thermal camera, which is available directly from Regal as well. 
As I mentioned, it does have or it does incorporate a high accuracy OEM IME GNSS system from Aplanix, the AP60. It has an integrated comprehensive flight management system, which also supports simultaneous LIDAR and imagery acquisition. And we provide two options to our, our users, both pause track and or a top, topo flight. And as you can tell, based on the sensor morphology, we actually have a sensor nose cone around which the sensor structure has been designed uh, enabling a drop-in fitment into an optional gyro-stabilized mount. And this kind of brings us to our for, first poll. So what primary applications does your business focus on? Is it wide area topo mapping, corridor mapping, urban mapping, forestry and agriculture? And based on that, it looks like the majority of you are focused on the wide area mapping. Um, of course, corridor mapping is, is, a, is a, a very popular um, uh, application and the fact that uh, our percentages add to over 100 it looks like uh, many of us are doing uh, more than one particular application so they have a much more diversified business model so i mentioned the crossfire scan pattern what is it exactly well this slide shows basically um, the two independent data channels and the resulting swath coverage is created by the crossfire scan pattern and the benefits of this are really uh, about homogeneous point distribution across the entire 100% of the scan field of view. It allows excellent vertical density for urban corridor and forestry applications. And this is primarily a function of the pitched 4 aft scan geometry. It also has excellent vertical surface coverage with the counter rotated uh, beams as well. And this enables fewer occlusions in urban canyons and forested environments, um, particularly with its uh, nadir pass um, in combination with its off-axis orientation. Um, so it's not simply a pitched or forward bean geometry. It's also a geometry that supports a nadir look angle to really get down into those building canyons, as well as maintain the coverages uh, on both the front and the backs of the, of the targets as the sensor flies over them. It provides a simultaneous double pass over the target for an enhanced canopy penetration, ground detection, and, and density increase. Uh, with the two independent channels, we're creating basically uh, uh, two matrix scan patterns, which are then interleaved to um, uh, produce the scan geometry that we see with the crossfire pattern. And because we are using a common mirror with those two uh, laser channels, we do have exceptional calibration stability, which provides critical co-registration accuracy, particularly as, as, as it applies for long flight lines and, and if large block serving um, applications where that uh, high accuracy and registration is, is critical for delivering um, a high quality product. Now, when it comes to the new improvements uh, with the new sensor, what we have on this slide is basically the current model, the 1560 Mark II, and then the Mark IIs. So Regal will be offering both models uh, in its product portfolio, depending on uh, your performance uh, needs. And what you can see is, as with the 1560 Mark II, where we currently operate at uh, two times 500 kilohertz or, or say one megahertz operation, the maximum measurement range in that case is 2,800 meters. And when we look at the new Mark IIs, uh, we're able to maintain that uh, measurement range, but now at double the PRR or emission rate. And so this provides us about a 1.4 times range performance increase. Now, when we look at the productivity increases, that uh, that uh, extra range performance has to ultimately lead to uh, improvements in collection productivity. And with the 1560 Mark IIs, um, you can see that there's about a 25% increase over um, uh, collection requirements for two and eight points per square meter. So USGS QL, QL1 and QL2. Um, you can see that there's a significant um, difference when it comes to um, the, uh, or sorry, QO0 and QO1 or two, you can see there's about 25% difference in terms of the productivity increase. So, so that brings us to a question, 
Um, Peter, since, since you're on the line with us, the area acquisition rate, is the maximum area acquisition rate achievable only by reaching maximum flying height? Hello, Michael. Thank you for the question. Hello, everybody. This is Peter from really in Austria. Um, the question um, regarding uh, data acquisition efficiency has uh, many different facets. Uh, generally, um, the optimum is obtained as long as you're operating the laser scanner at its maximum pulse repetition rate because you make best use of the laser sources of the available bandwidth for capturing data and for storing data. So depending on your requirements, it's always better to fly first to, to increase the flying speed and only in the second step increase flying altitude. So that's uh, important to see because it has additional advantages if you if you can fly faster but lower at the same time as your atmospheric effects uh, lower, which effect uh, or may have adverse effects on the point uh, cloud accuracy. But yeah, for lower point densities, at the same time, you will reduce pulse repetition rate and then you can go higher. And that's the case with the VQ1560 Mark IIs, um, which enables now significantly higher flying altitudes for again increased data uh, acquisition efficiency uh peter if by looking at this chart we have 300 knots associated with the two points and the eight points per square meter um, collection scenario now are clients leaving performance on the table if their aircraft platforms can't achieve the 300 knots that's identified here um <clears throat> of course um you can obtain two points and eight points per square meter also from from lower flying speed. Um, this is just an example given from the data sheet. Um, in the data sheets, you will find uh, another chart which um, shows the data acquisition efficiency given over the point density, um, which where the values are calculated for a typical aircraft with a speed range of 80 knots to 100, uh, 180 knots. And um, within each flying speed range, you will find an optimum value if you make use in uh, calculating scanner parameters by a software called RAP Parameter. So I would like to draw your attention to the software tool, um, which really helps to find um, optimum parameters for maximizing the data acquisition rate at the same time. The software is free, freely available from our homepage. The only thing is you have to register on our web members page and can download it, um, no charge, no fees. So um, make best use of the software. All of our airborne laser scanners are implemented and uh, it allows a direct comparison of our instruments. Excellent. Peter, this next slide on area acquisition rates, um, did you want to explain to our listeners uh, what this chart means? Yeah, sure. Um, it's exactly the chart I was talk talking about. So these charts show um, the area acquisition rate versus the average point density. So on the vertical axis, it's the area acquisition rate. On the horizontal axis, the point density. And um, as mentioned before, these charts give you the optimum values for the area acquisition rate. So optimum settings of the laser scanner, making best use of its capabilities with respect to pulse repetition rate in the first step. In the second step, the maximum measurement range. And uh, this chart shows you our legacy of instruments. All of these instruments are discontinued. If you change to the next slide, you will see um, a difference on the vertical axis, I changed from the linear scale to a logarithmic scale. The reason is simple. Um, the logarithmic scale um, gives a better separation of the individual graphs. So these two instruments are discontinued. You see these two gray lines. If you do another click in this chart, we see two more also discontinued instruments. 
here it becomes interesting, the VQ780i and the VQ1560i, many of you may um, use these instruments still. The currently available VQ1560 Mark II and VQ780 uh, Mark II now in this chart are both two megahertz per channel instruments. The VQ780 Mark II has a single channel, two megahertz, the VQ1560 Mark II, two times two megahertz. At the same time, the laser sources use same laser power. Um, interestingly, the VQ1560 Mark II in this case is significantly more efficient when it comes to high point densities compared to the VQ780 Mark II. And the, the reason is simple. We make use of two times two megahertz, so four megahertz. Um, and um, you can fly faster to obtain the same point density. However, at the same time, we cannot fly higher because it's the same laser sources. Um, now, the VQ1560 Mark II S has stronger lasers. And this helps us, especially when it comes to point densities up to 20 points per square meter. So from zero to 20 points per square meter, we obtain a 25% higher efficiency, let's say up to 25%, um, because we can make use of higher flying altitudes. Um, these charts are calculated to obtain a regular point spacing over the entire range of point densities and area acquisition rates. That's important to mention because um, the scanning mechanism allows to be tuned according to flying speed and flying altitude as such that you almost with any setting, any configuration, you're able to obtain a regular point spacing on the ground, which means the points within a scan line have the same distance as scan line to scan line. And that's important when it comes to capturing a very regular point spacing on the ground, not missing any, any uh, small features over the swath. Peter, we have a question from the audience. Um, with this productivity increase and in increasing sampling density, what's the typical processing speed versus acquisition rate that service provider, providers could expect? Um, yeah, because we make the make use of the same pulse repetition rate, um, there is no change with respect um, to the VQ1560 Mark II. Um, what, what can be done is you cover a wider area per time compared to the VQ1560 Mark II. But um, generally, it's a difficult question. Um, the data processing speed typically for typical project is about uh, one to one uh, to the scanning time. So one hour of pure scanning would mean one hour processing time, roughly if you make use of a state-of-the-art uh, desktop PC with a decent number of kernels, I don't know, for example, 14 cores um, is what we use in the company on, on some of our machines. However, we do not process um, large projects. We process our uh, projects which are with the purpose of testing and calibra uh, system calibrations, but expect a ratio of one to one, maybe one to two, if you're scanning uh, difficult terrain with lots of multiple returns. Um, but these these are the typical values. Of course, if you do uh, cloud processing, you will be much faster making best use of parallel computing. Okay, great. Um, so that's the that's the laser power increases um, associated with the Mark II S uh, versus the current Mark II, um, and at the same time with that new laser, it looks like that we've uh, decreased the beam divergence even further, um, which gives us a target resolution from a given altitude of about 23 centimeters uh, from a thousand meters. Um, so that means that there's a, a new collimator in there. Um, at the same time. RIE Parameter, which is the uh, software Peter you just mentioned earlier, has been updated to show the actual beam footprint on the ground. Um, and this is a function of uh, the user can choose either the one over E or one over E squared value. 
um, is, which is particularly uh, important for forestry applications. Oftentimes we see RFPs come out that say, we want you to fly for a given point density, but we don't want our beam foot footprint diameter any larger than X. Uh, and therefore this now gives our, our or clients the opportunity to be able to flight plan uh, using the footprint diameter now as a constraint. So Peter, why is the beam divergence limited to 0.23 milliradians when over E squared or, or two, 23 centimeters at 1000 meters? Wouldn't even smaller beam divergence mean higher spatial resolution and accuracy? Uh, that's true. Um, if the laser beam divergence would, would go to direction of zero, um, of course, yes, you pinpoint each single measurement. Um, however, at the same time, the, um, the beam energy per area um, would increase dramatically. Um, and of course, we have to take care of eye safety at the same time. Um, and there exists a relevant limiting value. It's the MPE, the maximum permissible exposure value. And this is a difficult value given for uh, different wavelengths and um, uh, different types of lasers, different um, uh, pulse duration and so on. So we have to consider this in order to stay eye safe. Um, therefore, there is a certain sweet spot for the laser beam divergence, and this is around 0 0.25 to 0 0.23 milliradians. Um, how, what, what the exact value is is more scientific question if it's 0 0.02 milliradians more or less. Um, but um, yes, a further increase, or, or that correctly, it would be a decrease of the beam divergence would at the same time increase the necessary safety distance, which means you would need to fly higher again to stay eye safe for people on the ground. And flying higher again means lower measurement quality due to the measurement accuracy of the IMU sensor, plus um, the uh, effects of atmosphere, atmospheric refraction index. Understood. OK. Um, and just to summarize with the with the 1560 and the Mark IIS advantages, um, we've got uh, improved collection efficiency with the new higher power lasers. Uh, there's exceptional point distribution and data quality across 100% of the scan field of view. We now have superior vertical density for asset mapping in corridor applications, fewer occlusions in urban and complex environments with its unique opposing scan channels a simultaneous double pass with a high power laser and smaller beam divergence over target areas provide enhanced canopy penetration and true ground detection. We have superior calibration stability uh, with respect to not requiring uh, unique scan parameter changes as those scan parameters uh, change over time. Um, and finally, onboard atmospheric um, noise suppression minimizes post-processing filtering editing for rapid data deliverables and superior raw data quality. Uh, another question, what planning or operational best practices are still required despite the crossfire scan geometry for say minimizing building occlusions or data voids when planning a flight over a city? Um, we have some um, experience as we flew over the uh, city of Vienna with one of the previous versions of the VQ1560. And um, the target was to yeah, minimize shadowing effects or occlusions uh, in narrow street canyons. We came up with a flight, flight plan uh, with 50% uh, overlap. I think poo, the flying altitude, something around 1,000 meters above ground level, but this is not that critical. Um, the 50% overlap um, of the swath really uh played out well as um yeah the nadir look from one swath um uh, matches the edges of the second swath where we have this forward and backward looking capability so there exists um a demo data set i think michael i will provide it to you maybe you can share it if so somebody's interested um but uh, the results are really um impressive um 
maybe there are other other flight patterns as well, but the 50% overlap and all of these in parallel scan lines. So it was, was not even necessary to fly perpendicular lines. Okay, great. Yes, in fact, I, I do have that data set. So if anyone's interested in uh, connecting with us uh, after the webinar, we can certainly provide um, uh, a sample data set that was collected with the 50% side lap using the crossfire scan geometry. And in an earlier webinar, I, I was demonstrating the uh, occlusion free um, data sets that were possible using these best practices. So that's the 1560 Mark IIs uh, and it's all its new capabilities. Um, the next sensor announcement that we had was the Regal Vux 120. It's the new multi-look sensor. Uh, it runs at the same sampling frequencies that the uh, the, the um, slightly older Vux 240 does, um, but it has uh, a, a much lesser range performance um, compared to the 240. Now, it has also a larger field of view, but more importantly, it has this three independent scan perspective per scan and rotation. Uh, and so the new term uh, is the NFB scanning system. Although I did see a LinkedIn comment about calling it the Trinity, uh, the Trinity pattern. Um, <laughs> so in the in the short term, um, we're referring right now to the Nader forward backwards uh, as the NFB system. But but of course, I think as uh, users get more experience, this this might be uh, coined differently. Um, so what we see here is uh, we have uh, three faucets on the mirror, one that directs a beam at Nader. And then, of course, there's a forward and aft looking uh, or backward facing faucet that's um, uh, separated by a 10 degree um, viewing angle. And so to the right, you can see the scanning geometry that you would get with the single rotation of the scanner. When we break down those individual faucets and we look at it in the context of uh, urban data collection, what you can see here uh, is a single pass at Nader. So of course we're getting the tops of the buildings and the ground uh, immediately uh, below the buildings, which is what you would normally see with most downlooking sensors. Now with the uh, as with the uh, second faucet of that scanner rotation now picking up the forward beam, what we see is the uh, front sides of that object now being covered. And of course, with the um, as we pass the objects, uh, we're picking up the back sides with the uh, the backward facing um, scan direction of minus 10 degrees. So th this has really interesting implications, particularly as it applies to um, corridor mapping or or mapping that requires the um, the a, a better model on, on both sides of the asset in a single flight direction. You know, there's no requirement necessary to come back the other way. Now, when we look at all these these patterns, it's sometimes difficult to say, okay, which pattern should I use under which condition and for what application? Um, what I'm going to show now briefly is is what patterns we do offer, and then we'll discuss how they can be used um, with the solutions that we offer for different applications. So this is the Vux 1L R. It's a it's a compact scanning system that can be deployed on UAVs as well as um, low flying helicopters. It has a single plan planar scanner which allows us to do uh, a single pass gives us the full 360 degree rotation. And based on the scan geometry, a single rotation gives you a single scan line. With the Vux 240, uh, the big brother of the of the 120, we've got a much faster scan rate. It's it's a 75 degree field of view, so really it's a it's a down look um, sensor. But with a four sided polygon uh, mirror, we're we're in fact getting four scan lines per rotation as opposed to one with the um, with the Vux 1LR. And then more recently, as I just showed you earlier, the uh, the new NFB scan pattern with the Vux 120 gives us a three scan line geometry through a single rotation, but with the plus minus 10 degree offsets. In this case, we in fact get uh, look angles ahead of and behind the target. And of course, directly uh, above to provide us uh, enhanced coverage uh, in, in the along the flight line. 
as we look at the two sensors individually, the, the VUX 240 versus the VUX 120, um, the VUX 120 is significantly smaller and lighter than the 240. Um, you know that's that's largely a function of a of a smaller laser power supply, um, but in this case, it really allows us to have a multi-perspective look um, configuration for UAV and, and helicopter installations that are focused on uh, vertical object mapping, whether they be power lines, uh, transmission towers, or forestry type applications. What application would you primarily consider for the new VUX 120 and its unique? NFP scan pattern? Would it be power line mapping, forestry, urban mapping? What, the, what would your business model typically support? And yeah, it looks like 84% uh, of people are utilizing a sensor like this specifically for power line mapping. Um, and there's a fairly healthy um, use of the sensor for, for possibly forestry or even more urban mapping applications. Um, but, but clearly power line mapping is, is the application. So when it comes to all those sensors, um, we talked about uh, the solution we offer with the 1560 Mark IIs. It has uh, everything you need as a bolt-on to, to go fly, including flight management system and the, the high accuracy uh, inertial system. Um, but as we move down our product portfolio from sensors to solutions, um, we have now um, started introducing sensor configuration packages that are designed specifically for application areas. Uh, and with this new sensor scan geometries that we're enabling, we can really get some excellent um, application specific designs out there. So starting at the bottom with the VP1, in this case, we have the VUX1LR. Uh, we discussed it has a 360-degree rotation. So this 360-degree this, this field of view is uh, really uh, optimally used for asset inspections so where, where you're not necessarily flying directly above the power line. You might want to fly on either side, so parallel flying next to the asset. Um, it doesn't necessarily have the high... I, uh, point density, um, but it still provides what's required um, uh, in a single pass at 25 points per square meter, 40 knots, depending on the wire, wire size in this case. And so all these values of point density are assuming a partial footprint return, in this case, on a uh, two centimeter wire diameter. I mean, of, of course, these sensors can provide a much higher uh, capability in terms of altitudes, assuming a full footprint interception, but um, this chart is showing the what's possible with uh, which much smaller partial target reception. As we move up from the VP1, we have the new VPX1 pod. Um, this pod is able to handle a, a number of different camera options and scanner configurations. I'll review that shortly. And then we also, again, we have the VP1 pod, but this time with the VUX240. And so now we have the downlook configuration, uh, which provides a higher point density at higher velocity. So this type of solution would be used more for power line transmission work um, as opposed to st uh, strictly uh, inspection work. And as uh, we move up the chart, the VQ480, um, it utilizes, much like the, the sensors below it, the 1.5 micron laser, uh, maintaining uh, very low NOHD values, um, you know, less than half a meter uh, from an IP safety perspective. But this time we can actually install this in an aircraft. Um, you can see based on the product design that the sides are shaved. Um, but curved at the end. So that curved shape allows it to drop fit into GSM with about a 16 uh, inch diameter. And then we can attach uh, medium format 150 megapixel cameras on either side within the GSM. And we have access to the full 75 degree field of view without any uh, uh, FOV obstruction due to the fuselage sides that you might see with a flush mount system design. And then back up to the top, we've got the 1560 Mark IIs, and, and what we've been seeing is um, clients repurposing that instrument for the low altitude, high density collects uh, at speed. Um, and with the unique scan geometry, you've got the nadir pass through over the asset. 
um, but then you have the multi perspective look angles to the surrounding vegetation which is um, important to being able to document uh, that vegetation accurately and precisely for forest or for um, fall in distances and encroachment distances uh, and whatnot for vegetation management practices. A little closer look at the, the VPX1 pod here. So what you see to the left is a perspective view of the pod. Um, what's different about this pod is you can see the nadir and the four aft oblique look angles. Um, and of course, uh, the, the, the overall size of the pod is, is quite small. Um, there are some design constraints which are required to meet a, a variety of different mounting options on uh, FA approved uh, mounting pods and whatnot that are, exist out there. Um, so we have met those. This entire pod um, with the configurations, of the, uh, they're offered with multiple cameras and the LiDAR sensor and, and now a high accuracy IMU, all with fit within a less than 25 kilogram uh, payload. Um, so that's fantastic. Now, one of the other things to really think about when it comes to uh, helicopter compatibility is the how easy is it to transition this pod from one aircraft type to another. Um, and so the, the VPX and the VP1 are all uh, compatible with the uh, Dovetail uh, Quick Disconnect Mounting System that's available from Meeker. Um, these pods are sold with that mount uh, uh, as part of that uh, solution. And that dovetail mount is uh, a universal mount that fits on any number of FA approved poles and mounts that are offered by Meeker, including the Bell Tool 6, 407, 429. There's the AS350. Uh, there's the, there's Robinson helicopters, nose mounts, tail mounts, aft mounts. Um, really, whatever platform helicopter platforms that, that, that largely exist out there, um, these pods can bolt right directly to them. Uh, quite quickly. And of course, that, that disconnect dovetail mounting system uh, enables uh, easy installation and, and, uh, re and removal and reattachment in the field. From, from a solution performance comparison, um, I talked a little bit about the application of each of these sensor configurations um, with respect to the power line industry. So at the bottom of our chart, we see um, some application examples, line inspection, distribution, and transmission within the power line industry. Um, so the Vux LR will, of course, be more associated with a line inspection um, type application. The VUX120, it can also do the line inspection, uh, but with the uh, four-aft look angle of the uh, transmission towers, um, that adds a whole element of data quality that wasn't there in the past. Um, but it does have lesser range performance, so it may not be flown as, as high as maybe some of the, the other sensors in the portfolio. So the, the next sensor the solution we discussed was the VP1 pod with the VUX240. Again, uh, this scanner and the, and the VUX120 utilize uh, a very fast scan rate. So while we have uh, 1800 uh, PRR for an effective uh, 1.5 PRR on the ground, if you're flying at 150 meters at uh, 60 knots, you're actually putting down 200 points per square meter. And, um, and when we consider the beam divergence of this sensor, it says 0 0.35, um, that translates to about an 06 um, meter beam footprint at 150 meters. And at 200 points per square meter, uh, the XY point distribution is also 0 0.06. Uh, and so while this beam divergence is slightly larger, particularly as it's required for eye safety use to have next to, uh, a, a next to zero value on our NOHD, um, it has uh, any smaller resolution is not really taken advantage of unless we're going above 200 points per square meter. Um, so very well designed system, ideally suited for corridor mapping applications that focus on that low altitude collect. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, we go up into the 480 and the 1560, which are more uh, aircraft uh, dependence uh, sensor configurations. We're not really doing line inspection in this case. The, um, we're, we're really looking at area coverage rates over distribution lines and, and uh, of course transmission lines. Now when it comes to the VPX pod itself, um, it can actually uh, 
um, we can retrofit the VUX 240 or the VUX 120. So um, if you have a need for that uh, off axis um, uh, LIDAR perspective to get four and a half coverages uh, on the towers, then the, the 120s is certainly an option. Um, we have the flexibility to choose cameras. So whether it's the Sony Alphas, the 60 megapixel, or even the high resolution phase one IXM 100s. Um, the IXM 100s have uh, the same pixel resolution as, as the 150. So the data quality is the same, uh, much cheaper though. Um, and also has a faster frame rate. Um, so uh, while the 150 may be an ideal requirement, it's not necessarily the optimum requirement when we're looking at price and performance. Uh, the, the, one, the 100 can still provide the similar performance. The 150 really is probably more uh, designed for higher altitude work where you have a larger overall footprint despite the same resolution. So another poll. Um, let's see here, I'm gonna launch it. Does the new VPX1 pod in the sensor configuration described meet the needs of your corridor clients? Okay, so results show about 65% say yes. So uh, I, I think we're, we're we're almost there, but clearly uh, there the 30, there's 30% of you that say almost. So, so there is still something missing. Um, well, uh, it'd be interesting to know what that is. Um, but one thing I can say is um, the sensor configuration associated with the VPX1 pod uh, is showing a four aft oblique and a single nader camera. Um, and there have been requests that, that, that uh, clients have, have asked, you know, could we offer a dual cam situation whereby we have an achromatic and an RGB at nader, and then we maintain the forward oblique. Um, as we, as clients may have to deliver to vegetation management initiatives, um, the, the four band imagery is often a, a requirement. That is, that is a configuration we can certainly um, uh, entertain. Um, and on top of that, um, we will also be discussing the um, the web thermal hydrobarometer, um, which we will be attaching within the pod, um, which will provide you with the with the air temperature, pressure, and relative humidity during collection as well, uh, to really give us a, a fully um, capable system. Um, but with all the advantages of being off the shelf, bolted onto a uh, maker uh, FAA approved pole mount and, and off you go. So Peter, that, and that leads to a good question is, does the VPX1 pod come with an FAA form one? Um, thanks for the question. Um, as I expected this, because um, you mentioned that the, the mount is FAA approved. Um, no, no, a Form 1 is a very specific um, uh, paperwork, which is filed for products which are produced by companies which are allowed to yeah, manufacture, design and manufacture aircraft parts. So this is clearly not an aircraft part in the sense of uh, the aviation authorities. However, um, of course, um, it needs a certain kind of certification. Typically, the pod is, uh, requires an STC. This is a supplemental type certificate. And um, this STC is valid for one combination of a pod with a specific serial number, plus the aircraft where it's mounted to, a helicopter or airplane, um, also a specific individual aircraft with a serial number. And then um, operations of the aircraft are uh, legal and allowed. So these STCs are typically um, applied by the aircraft owner and the aircraft owner asks a maintenance company in most cases or a company which is um, which, which uh, holds a, a DOA or a, a so this design organization approval or uh, production organization approval, POA. And these companies take care of providing all the necessary information for the aviation authorities to prove that the system is safe, that the system complies with uh, requirements like the DO160. So there's a number of regulations which uh, the system has to comply then in the end. 
and then um, the user, the, the aircraft owner is allowed to operate the aircraft. What we do from our side, Regal, um, we provide the necessary information as far as possible. Typically, these are uh, questions about materials uh, used, flammability, uh, cables, and so on. And also, and that's important for all air, um, installations of laser scanners in aircrafts, when it comes to laser sources which exceed laser class two, that um, major change is required. So the SDC um, is also required to be filed from the aviation authorities. This is the case in Europe, um, and it is very similar in the US, where it is currently uh, only a recommendation. Uh, in Europe, it is already um, yeah, valid legis legislation. Understood. I hope this answers the question. <laughs> Understood. So uh, I, I think generally speaking, what we have is uh, we have a configuration that's available com uh, commercially off the shelf uh, with no additional uh, custom design work necessarily required. It bolts onto standard mounts and whatnot. The mounts, the mounts are in fact FAA approved, but in terms of the installation of the entire configuration, um, then we would have to then clients would work with uh, an organization that would develop the STC uh, to be able to mount it into their specific aircraft. And of course, we would provide documentation and assistance to support that. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, so the last thing on our on our list here is um, we had now actually incorporate a meteorological uh, sensor input. Um, in this case, a web thermal hydrobarometer um, that allows us to basically monitor and record uh, temperature, relative humidity, and air pressure while in the air. And our RIA Acquire, which is the uh, operator, primary operator interface um, for the laser systems, um, which also controls the cameras. Um, you can visualize that data feed uh, in a window within the RIA Acquire software while in flight. Um, at the same time, that data is being automatically lo logged to an atmospheric condition file. In the past, operators might uh, enter that information manually, uh, but now it's done at a uh, regular interval uh, automatically. And then that, and then that data is basically, uh, or that file is is then brought to the the post processing environment, where the um, the refraction corrections uh, due to atmospheric attenuation uh, are are added to the range value or to the to the, to the equation of correcting the range value to provide you with the correct range to ground um, and further optimizing your, your data accuracy and precision. Um, and then finally, that, that same file could also be used as a secondary input into any value added uh, third party applications that may want that information for looking at things like sway or sag analysis, um, uh, which would be proximal to the uh, power line during collection. And with that, what we'll do is um, we have a short video that we want to uh, show you, which shows the, uh, the installation of our VQ580 Mark II.
The aircraft has a 310 horsepower Textron-like homing engine and offers a wide operational range of uh, 80 knots up to 180 knots at flying altitudes up to 7,300 meters, which are about uh, 24,000 feet. And yeah, this makes it a perfectly uh, versatile platform for almost any airborne laser scanning application. And that's the reason why we also use it in our company for performing test flights and calibration flights for all our instruments. Um, the, in the, the aircraft you've just seen in the video um, was uh, is produced uh, and, and was directly ordered from Cessna in uh, Wichita, USA, where they have the headquarters. Um, the necessary major change of cutting the hatch is then done by a company uh, in Denver, Colorado, USA. It's Straight Flight Incorporated. And uh, then the aircraft is pre well prepared. It uh, then in the next step came to Austria where the company Airborne Technologies, they're located close to Vienna in Wiener Neustadt. Um, they did uh, the STC approvals for the individual instruments configurations, which are the VQ 1560 Mark II, VQ 780 Mark II, the bathymetry system VQ 880 G Mark II, and the VQ 840 G, and furthermore, the, the uh, airborne laser scanners VQ 480, VQ 580, VX 240, and all of our. Uh, uh, already discontinued instruments which we sometimes have to fly for uh, calibration purposes. As we wrap up, got a couple more questions here. Um, uh, one is, it's probably an obvious one, when will the 1560 Mark II S be available for delivery? Um, we will uh, be able to deliver the first instruments by first quarter of next year. Okay, and is is that the same for the VPX one pod and the Vux one twenty, yes, or are they on different yes. timelines? No, no, it's it should be the same timeline. Okay, but but busy taking orders now. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, another question, so, sort of unrelated to what we've been discussing, but um, MTA processing, um, what is it? And it's it's we see that term on a lot of sensor specification sheets. So what what is it and how does it affect the final data quality? Okay, um, yeah, MTA means multiple time around. Um, it's a term which is coined from radar technology yeah, many decades ago already. Um, it means that we emit laser pulses at such high rate that we cannot um, uh, directly relate the echoes with emitted laser pulses. So we emit a number of pulses until we receive the echo from the very first laser emission. So this leads to an uh, ambiguity issue and uh, it has to be resolved. It's not linked or limited to regal products whatsoever. Every laser scanner today has the same issue. We um, had the first solution for this problem. Um, we make use of a very specific modulation scheme in the in the train of laser pulses emitted and we are able using um, this uh, modulation in the in the in the time domain of the received echoes to determine um, the correct measurement range which may be multiples of certain MTA zone width and um, how does it affect the user? Yeah, typically not at all. Um, you won't notice the algorithm. There is nothing to set or, or configure uh, in post-processing. Uh, in post-processing, this happens in the very first steps uh, in the processing chain in RI Analyze to those who use the software or STC import. Um, and it does not affect the data. It does not affect the data, the measurement accuracy, as well as um, it does not um, produce any issues in the transition zones of MTA zones. So the transition zone is where the measurement range is just at the limit of, for example, four pulses in the air at the same time. 
So when it slightly gets longer now, we have five pulses in the air at the same time. And there is a small transition zone, which um, the, those who operated the old instruments, which are discontinued, know that there was a slight reduction in the point density. But um, with our latest um, uh, data processing capabilities, um, this is history. And all of our instruments today um, feature gapless acquisition over the entire uh, measurement range when it comes to uh, about 20% target reflectivity. Does this okay. answer the question, do you think? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, so uh, on those lines, um, you know, there is, there's, we have a, a new acronym which has been used for a number of years now called uh, o, OWP or Online Waveform Processing. Um, can, so can you explain the differences between online waveform processing versus standard for waveform recording and when, when, I, when I might uh, expect to use either? Mm -hmm. um, so full waveform analysis, um, full wave, so full waveform digitization was the first time introduced with the LMS Q560. Uh, the instrument um, digitized the waveform of the emitted laser pulse and it digitized the entire waveform um, of the received echoes um, with some uh, yeah, clever um, data reduction pro, uh, um, algorithms. So we only record data as soon as an echo comes in with some uh, pre-trigger and so on. So it's quite fancy. And this was the first time used with LMS Q560. It requires post-processing of full waveform data, which means um, we need to take some assumption or knowledge about the shape of the emitted laser pulse. And by Gaussian deconvolution, we are able to um, <clears throat> determine exact measurement ranges and furthermore um, derive additional features or um, uh, attributes for the echoes, which are um, the target reflectance and the pulse shape deviation. So how does the pulse change? How did it change? Um, in the echo with respect to the emitted laser shot. And this technique now um, is has been used uh, or is still used up to the VQ780 Mark II and the VQ1560 Mark II. But in the meantime, um, there was a development ongoing uh, to bring this technology inside the instruments to do this in real time, the whole analysis part which was previously done in post-processing on a desktop PC um, is now possible inside the instrument. And um, of course, the advantage um, is obvious. Uh, it's in, it lies in the, in the, in the uh, increased processing speed. However, the results are similar or absolutely comparable. Um, we have got a highly accurate measurement range. Um, plus the additional attributes for each echo and um, the number of echoes is only limited by the bandwidth of the instruments. So at two megahertz, typically we can resolve up to four echoes for one laser shot. And um, as it is band bandwidth limited, um, the lower the pulse repetition rate, the higher the number of echoes you can obtain from online waveform processing up to 15 echoes at the one or 200 uh, megahertz pulse repetition rates. Yeah, and as mentioned before, online waveform processing um, is now state of the art for all VLAN instruments. Additionally, the full waveform recording is available for the VQ780 Mark II and the VQ1560 Mark II S as well. Okay, thank you. So it, it sounds like um, um, uh, all that uh, back-end processing of the full waveform, the Gaussian deconvolution is now being performed in the air, which I'm assuming results in, in smaller output files, which further enhances our processing productivity down the road. Yes, that's correct. So file size uh, of full waveform data, as you can imagine, we are sampling with a one gigahertz sampling rate 
um, in most instruments, um, the file size is large <laughs> and um, the online waveform processing uh, reduces it dramatically. Excellent. Um, all right, so that draws us to the end of the presentation. Uh, well, there was one last question about showing the VUX120 video. Um, I don't have that uh, loaded, but uh, what we'll do is we'll send out a link with that video um, to our YouTube site. And of course, we will be um, uh, compiling this presentation and making it available to uh, our registered attendees as well. So Peter, I wanna thank you very much for uh, supporting me in this presentation. And mm -hmm. I hope everyone, um, Got a lot of uh, new information on our new product releases and, and application solutions. And if you have any information at all uh, or want to follow up with a further discussion, please send us an email at info at regalusa.com uh, or call us directly at 407-248-9927. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll talk soon.